Hogstock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hogsty. It is the week of the Combine, which usually gets NFL fans' juices flowing, or at least it used to. Feels like that's gotten less and less hype this year and last year. I think uh, the pandemic screwed it up. Uh, it just feels like the Combine's not as exciting as it used to be to me. Maybe it's just me, because I don't watch NFL Network because I don't have cable. Well, <laughs> the... The coronavirus didn't just screw it up last year. It ended it totally. There wasn't a combine last right. year at all. Right, and now the players are complaining about the combine all the time. I, I, yeah, which is just, first of all, absurd. But um, I have always liked the combine, but I think its usefulness is more limited than yeah. you might think. Yeah. Jamal, I, Steve I, and I were talking about this before the show, uh, before you got on. Players know how to game the combine now, right? And that's the problem. Well, uh, I mean, it's everything is a business. So I like the, the smarter the players get, the, the I guess the better for them. But you know, I I, I was gonna mention, I, I found it weird. Now I was I was wrong when I first saw it, but when I was watching the quarterbacks and wide receivers and uh, tight ends on Thursday, it dawned on me that the combine had fans in the seats. I was like, where the hell did all these fans come from? When did they start having fans in the combine? Like, it, it seemed so weird because it was always something where it's just scouts and coaches. And, um, apparently, they've been doing that for years, like since like 2017. So it was just weird to see it, given that we were a year off um, from the whole thing. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of fans are, are back at <laughs> are back in the in the seats. And, and it seems like everything is coming back to normal. Uh, yeah, I don't think the whole stadium's filled or anything, but I knew they they um, they do sell some tickets. Uh, yeah, you know, again, not, it, not yeah, I mean, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a fun thing to watch. Um, I tend to think probably with what's most useful are the things that we don't see, mm-hmm. which is one, the interviews, and two, the medical. Right. Sometimes I think that the um, probably the least useful is what everybody is everybody sees which is the workouts you know the the on-field workouts yeah well i mean it used to be at least i feel like when people were peak like combine fandom it was oh my god look at this 40 time oh my god look at like people just obsessed with things with the numbers that guys put up bench reps or whatever um i don't know like i think we've all kind of figured out what you just said steve the best stuff that happens at the combine for the scouts is the interviews. Um, so for me, I actually, I haven't watched any of the combine, but I went and watched every quarterback's press interview. Cause that's the closest we can get to what, you know, the quarterbacks will probably be talk how they talk to, you know, scouts and coaches. Yeah, no, I think that's probably true. And, and you know, what I've learned from watching more and more college film over the years is that's so much more important than, these little on-field workouts, uh, you know? Mm. So, yeah, I I would love to be a fly on the wall for the interviews, which obviously we can't be. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I would love to know what's going on, Um, especially when it comes to Washington, just seeing how they how they process things and how they think. But just in general, knowing the process, I would love to, you know, know a little bit more about it, the intricacies of it. Mm -hmm. Uh. By the way, folks, if you hear a little bit of a weird thing uh, when Jamal's talking, he is driving right now. <laughs> He's in the car right now, so. Oh, what are y'all here? Because I, 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 uh, I, I mean, it, it's just a little bit of background noise time. Yeah, it's that. a That's little a, off oh, okay. from normal. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not quite what, you know, in your home studio is a lot better. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Who, who's shocked that your car is not as good as a, like, $100 <laughs> mic that you have at home? <laughs> uh, yeah, that is true. Yeah. So, but, so point is, we don't have a ton of anything to say about the combine just yet you know we're Mm -hmm. everybody's still kind of watching and processing so if there's anything spectacular comes out we'll probably address it next week well i will say since i sat there and watched every quarterback interview matt corral actually really impressed me surprisingly in his when he was speaking uh he comes off as very engaging uh 
I mean, so. John Beck came off as pretty impressive when he spoke, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's only a, one aspect, it, and it's not the hugest thing. As long as you don't come off like a complete idiot, you know, you're going to be fine. Uh, like Kyle oh, Murray, yeah. remember when he had that weird interview and he just was totally zoned well, out? Frankly, I think Kyle Murray yeah. is a complete idiot. He can just play football. <laughs> yeah. He, I, I mean, it, look, you don't have to be a genius necessarily to be no. a good football player. You know, those two well, do not always tie together. Well, I always thought that, like, Lamar Jackson got a bad rap mm-hmm. you know, because of just his accent and kind of the dialect with the, with, with which he spoke. He right. speaks. Um, I think there's a bit of racism tinge to it because people make certain assumptions about him or made certain assumptions about him because of it. And it really wasn't fair to him. And he's a much better quarterback than a lot of people assumed. And, again, I think it all sort of stemmed back to – this man's a southern black man, and he got so he's got know, the heavy draw. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that um, look, yeah, if you have a southern accent, people think you're going to be slow just because you speak slower. Yeah, it, that's it's just a fact about American culture. What's that, Jamal? I think we, yeah, we, you no, no, I was, I was agreeing. I was saying, yeah, that uh, I think I was saying bias, but I, I think it's like what implicit bias is that? Is that the right word for for that that type of stuff? Yeah, well, implicit bias, yeah, that means yes, that yes, that's what you're. You talking know, I, about. I, str- I struggle, I struggle with my my words sometimes. It makes sense. <laughs> like I wasn't entirely too confident when I said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People used to say it about Doug Williams all the time because he's got that really heavy accent, you know. Yeah, he does. Well, I, Doug Williams needs to not be in front of a microphone. <laughs> you know. I, I, was, I was also going to transition to that. I, I feel like he's been set up one too many times. He can't. He can't. He can't. He right. he, he he's he's in he's in a bad space. <laughs> well, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, I think set up is the right word because they keep throwing him out there and making right. him talk about things they shouldn't make him talk about. You know, and, anytime it's something that'll embarrass the team, hey, they throw Doug, Doug out. Williams out there, yeah, because yeah. Doug is a hero, <laughs> right? It, you know, but it doesn't matter that he can't really articulate it very well. Uh, right. You know, it, it, Dan Snyder needs, of course, you know, look who I'm talking about, a uh, you know, the spawn of Satan, but um, Dan Snyder's the guy who needs to be doing some of these complicated pressers, but he's too scared to do it, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. All right. Um, I, we'll talk more about the combine, I think, and some of the results that came out next yeah. week, because um, I don't think everything's been done yet. So there are a few things that have happened, and you know, uh, they, they've done some bench presses and stuff. But uh, we'll get back to that, especially about offensive tackle, because those are the uh, position groups we're covering this week is offensive tackle. Uh, but I know uh, one thing we have to touch on is a report that just came out last night, uh, and then we'll get into tackles. Washington apparently did make an offer on Russell Wilson uh, earlier this year. Uh, you know, at the no, end no, of the season. Week, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, we've all heard that Pete Carroll has said, we're not trading Russell Wilson. Don't care. Washington offered multiple first-round picks to try and get him. And was rebuffed right away. So I know a lot of people out there were like, well, when are they going to make a move? When are they Apparently they did try. So, you know, that's all you can ever ask is, did you try? <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, Alex. Here's my thing, because I was talking to um, I was talking to some people last night. And I'm going I'm to put this theory out there and, and I want to get y'all opinion. So. It's been weird for me trying to process how everything has been going down since the season ended. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, like, Ron Rivera, I've never seen, and if we think about it, I've never seen, like, a coach to this level. Like, people have done it before. But I've never seen a coach to this level be so public about what they need at the quarterback position. I've never seen a coach say, we're willing to do whatever it takes. We want the word to go out there. We want everybody to know we need a superstar quarterback. We need yeah. our answer at quarterback. I've never seen nothing to that degree. And he's been doing it since the season ended. And what is making me conflicted in my head is that when you peel back the layers of every single quarterback option, when we talk about top tier veterans, not the mid tier Nothing right. like that. Not when guys who are going to be free agents. Yeah, not guys who will be free agents or even other trade options. I'm like, even still, like Jimmy G is a trade option. 
Okay, um, I got you. At one point, Derek Carr was until they found their head coach, et cetera, all those things. I'm talking about Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers. Like, those those tiers. And those are the most commonly, frequently used names out there in terms of options at one point. <laughs> but when you peel back the layers at, of every single option or those three, knowing how tricky the Deshaun Washington situation would be, but then also knowing Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers and what they would want, Aaron Rodgers may return, may retire, or may go to the AFC. Russell mm-hmm. Wilson and Pete Carroll, at one point you was wondering exactly how um, would Pete Carroll want to return knowing he's not going to have his superstar quarterback and and just understanding like further how it's more likely for him to stay versus him to leave. I think Ron knows it even more than we do. Like, I think he's aware of how hard it's going to be to get these quarterbacks. And I don't think he knew it in the beginning. I knew that he, he can try and probably think he could persuade these guys, but the more time goes along and the more information that comes out, he knew it before we did. And I think that he's putting these things out there. Like, look, we're trying, we, this is what we want. We want everybody to know we want these things. And then the information of the trade and the the offer came out against with Seattle last night. I think that is a continuance of a uh, uh, a media ploy and and just knowing people uh, like what you just said, Alex. At least they're trying. I think that's I think that's what they want people to say, and I think that's what's working right now is that they want people to say it, knowing that they probably won't get either of these three, uh, given the situation. Like. It's a low. I'm not saying it's impossible, and I'm I'm not saying it won't happen. But I think that they're they're building up the fence. Like this is what they're doing. They're building up the fence. So in the event that they don't get these guys, they know that uh, people know they were aggressive in their offers and in their pursuit of these quarterbacks. Uh, and, and and I think that's the fail safe. Is just in case they don't get it, they want everybody to know exactly what they're doing. Um. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I need a supermodel girlfriend, too, but it's just as likely, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, my my newfound objectivity, since I'm no longer a fan of the team, um, tells me that there's no way Russell Wilson was ever going to come to Washington. There's no way, you know, Aaron Rodgers is going to come to Washington. They'd have to be idiots to trade for Deshaun Watson. I think Jamal's got a pretty good point and a pretty good theory here. Um, the fan base will be mollified to a certain extent if they believe that the team has done everything they could. So this is a case of possibly Ron Rivera saying, hey, look, we tried to get Russell Wilson. Ron knows Russell Wilson didn't come into Washington, D.C. He knows that. But if he convinces the public that they tried, the public will be more satisfied. And when they end up with some middle of the road dude, you know, whoever, pick, you know, Teddy Bridgewater type, the fan base won't be quite as angry and so i, I think that's sort of what's mariota you're... type what's that <laughs> marcus mariota type was what i was gonna yeah say. whoever yeah whatever yeah. pick your pick your pick your poison but um I, I think jamal's got a pretty good theory here because no the teams normally don't just flat out announce what they're doing right and they not only did they announce what they went after those three they said they made it known that they have contacted every team in the league 40 something you know. quarterbacks yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I think that's not a bad theory, but it's not going to happen. I mean, people need to understand that Russell Wilson didn't come into D.C. Aaron Rodgers not coming to D.C. Um, yeah. Deshaun Watson shouldn't come to D.C. <laughs> Even if he wants to, the team shouldn't want him. So uh, I just they're not going to get one of those guys. And, and Ron even went farther than what Jamal said. He said we need a veteran. Heard him right. say that this week. Yeah, yeah, you know? that's true. He was saying that at the combine uh, on yeah. CBS. Yeah, so it's not a bad theory, Jamal. I, I, I'm kind of with you on it. Yeah, I, I just don't. That's just my thing. I, I just don't. Now, also, as as people are listening, I want y'all to understand, yes, hell yes, you're supposed to make offers. You're supposed to be aggressive. Like, that's not the, that's not the, like, that's not the problem. Um, Like, obviously make your offers because you never know what can happen. You're just not, you're not supposed to sit back and just say, well, we know these guys ain't trading, so what's the point of asking? Right. No, do put put it out there. Mm-hmm. But but in terms of the media side, I've never seen somebody, uh, and never seen a situation in which they put this much information out there to to let people know what they're up to versus trying to get the job done and letting things come back 
over time. Like last year, um, we knew Matt Stafford was going to be traded in Detroit. Um, and we later found out that they inquired and made a strong offer after the fact mm-hmm. um, for Matt Stafford. And they also, I think they, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, but I know that they were in play for Jared Goff at some point too. Um, if I'm, if my memory serves me right to some degree, I don't know like what they offered, but I think they were in play to some degree, but we found out after the fact, but, but now all of a sudden after two seven to nine seasons and understanding the situation that you're in from a head coaching standpoint and how, how things looked and how things uh, seemingly took a step back last year, um, you're, you're out there telling us, you know, what you want to do in every step of the way, how you're, what you've done to kind of emphasize the fact that you want or that you need that veteran quarterback. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I mean, I mean, it is. Yeah. They've been very public about it. It is a little awkward. Uh, I can't think of a time Washington's been more like obvious about it since 2012 when at least then it was like we traded a hundred picks and now we're going to get a quarterback. So, yes, I was about to say that part too. That's, 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 a, that's a fact that when they made that big splash, like mm-hmm. we knew that Washington needed a quarterback that year. We didn't know that they were going to uh, make that big of a splash to move up like weeks before the draft even took place. Yeah, like, they did that, that very early on. Exactly. So like they didn't they didn't make no noise about it. They just did it. Mm-hmm. They just did yeah. it. And, and it wasn't until 18 months later that we didn't we knew that that wasn't going to work out. You right. know, that whole first year of Robert Griffin's career, everybody thought he was this guy's the future. Yeah, you right. know. I, I, well, and it, that was such a wild draft. What do you think? Two quarterbacks, both obvious, the one and two, uh, first and second pick at that point. Well, the uh, same thing happened in 1994 with Heath Schuler and uh, Patrick Ramsey. Uh, what? Not P- Heath Schuler and um, who they draft? They, they draft. Rott? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Gus Frad. I mean, okay. sure. I mean, uh, Gus Frad. Yeah, well, because yeah. Gus Frad ended up being a better quarterback, and he was like right. a sixth or seventh round pick. Same right. thing happened with Cousins and uh, Griffin. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right. Well, although if you all have seen, like Kirk Cousins, I mean, the coach has been like publicly bashing him. <laughs> yeah, if oh, you all have seen uh, Zimmer. This. Yeah. 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 It, Who would have thought that Kirk Cousins would have been selfish and not caring wait. about winning? Tell me. Tell me. Yeah. Right. Tell me, tell me what happened. What was Zimmer? Well, Mike saying? Zimmer made it known that he doesn't like coaching Kirk Cousins. That's what what I saw. Yeah. Is that what you saw, Alex? Yeah, that's the gist of what I saw. Is he didn't say anything in particularly bad. It was just he found Kirk Cousins difficult to work with. Yeah. Uh, um, and now that he's been fired, he can say these things. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean Kirk Cousins is not a team player? What? Right? I think it's speaking of Kirk. I think it's hilarious. I don't know if you all know this or heard this, but um, this week I actually think it was yesterday where they mentioned um, uh, color. I'm thinking of Willis and and Cousins, but um, Cousins is not willing to uh renegotiate his contract and reduce his his 40 million dollar salary for the vikings and i'm like right. in my head i'm like uh if you ever expected that man to take less money and be more of a team player you haven't been paying attention <laughs> you yeah. you exactly you haven't been paying attention but also like that should just tell the minnesota vikings you aren't going to be in a position to win with him moving forward and let that man walk <laughs> at yeah. the end of, at the end of next season when his contract expires because yep it ain't it ain't no it ain't no point of trying to convince that man who's not gonna be the reason why you win these these the bigger games. Uh, just let him go and and try and find try and find something better. It's not going it's not easy, but look you you can't you can't keep dealing with a person that's going to hijack you uh, financially. Like just just keep it pushing. Uh, well, and shockingly enough, he's produced basically the same results as he did in Washington, which is yeah. big numbers, big stats, and a mediocre winning record right. with a much better talent. Yeah, well, I, but I mean, they've had to lose so much talent, too, because of his salary, yeah. which is what happens. Uh, um, yeah, 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 it it is kind of wild. Um, all right, guys, we should cover we, we do have our free agents and rookies we got to get to. Uh, and we're about a third of the way through the show. So I want to get to those real quick. We're doing tackles this week, both both free agent tackles and rookie tackles. Uh, we're going to just get it all out of the way, ripping the bandaid off of the O-line. Um, so he, here's the thing. Let, let's start by saying 
Washington re-signed their starting left tackle, you know, before the beginning of the season, right? So, Charles Leno. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not spending a lot of money on a tackle this year in free Well, they didn't just re-sign him. They signed him to a three-year, $37 million contract. Right. They gave so him he is money. the tack- left tackle of the future. Right. Right. Not technically elite starter money, but that's definitely good starter money. It's enough to say he's the guy who's the left tackle for the next couple of years, for sure. Right. And then the other guy is Sam Cosme. They've got Samuel Cosme. They've got a second-round pick in him. Uh, You know, he's uh, he's your right tackle, whether you like it or not. Did they re-sign the other guy, the swing tackle? Well, I mean, Uh, Charles is on the roster. David Steinmetz is on the roster. Cornelius Lucas has not been re-signed. Okay. I didn't think so. Uh, So if there's a gap here— I mean, does anybody think that Sadiq Charles is going to work out as a swing tackle? I mean, no, I think he's not. a guard at best at yeah. this point, right? And so, what realistically, they're going to have to find a swing tackle. What they right. ought to do is just re-sign Lucas because it's easiest. But there are some um, options here. Um, our writer, yeah. no one from Tampa, put a column up about it. Mm-hmm. And, and the first thing he did is list a bunch of starters who aren't going to be aren't going to come here. You know, Cam Robinson, Teron Armstead, Trent Brown, Eric Fisher, Brandon Shell. Morgan right. Moses, um, Jerron Christian, who used to be with Washington, <laughs> if, if everybody remembers, Orlando Brown. Right. Um, uh, you know, and so there's a few. And so the the ones that um, no one listed as potential swing tackle candidates, in his view, were Cameron Fleming, Josh mm-hmm. Wells, and Riley Reef. Um, right. I can't say that Josh Wells is a guy I can spout off too much about. But Fleming and Reef, uh, you know, Riley, Riley Reef, they, their names, they've been around, they're pros. Not, neither one would be bad. But, yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think they want to get back together with the old girlfriend, you know, in Jerron Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, Morgan Moses, no. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, a lot of these guys, Fisher, Robinson, I mean, they're not going to be swing tackles. I, I mean, even Reef, who uh, was one of the ones he mentioned, Looking at his just his games played, he's been a basically still starter. He's yeah. still a starter. Yeah, yeah. he's thirty three, so I know he's up there. So maybe that's what no one's thinking is, uh, well, he's old. It's going to start going downhill for him, kind of that kind of thinking. Uh, but he w- he started twelve games last year for Cincinnati, and and he's basically started fifteen, fifteen, thirteen, fifteen, fourteen. Like he's started every year, constantly. And, you know, I don't starter. see him coming yeah, anywhere as a starter. backup. I mean, the only thing I think you'd say is he's moved around a little bit. You know, he's with Detroit, just sure. Minnesota, had the one-year deal in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, would he be willing – because he's – um, how old did you say he is? He's 33. 33. Well, he yeah. was 33 last year, so 34, I guess, now. I mean, at some point, he's going to have to accept a role like that. Maybe this is the year. Or you, you know, just retire. You've had a great career. <laughs> <laughs> These guys don't want to retire. I mean, they want to keep making as much money as possible, you know. Yeah. And you can't blame them. I would. I'd want to stay in the league as long as I could. I mean, these guys, most of these guys are never going to make millions of dollars ever again. There's like three of them, you know, that are going to be broadcasters. Yeah, you know, I guess, and some that are, linemen, you're right. Yeah, and some of them are going to be coaches and stuff. But most of them are going to go back to a normal life. And they can't make this kind of money, so they want to stay in as long as possible. I understand that. Yeah, that's true. I, yeah. I I don't know what position did he play left or right tackle? By the way, Reef. He I know career wise he was a left tackle, but remember Cincinnati. He was with Cincinnati. Their line was terrible last He's year. He's been a left tackle yeah. the bulk of his career. He has yeah. played some right tackle. Oh, okay. I think um, for Washington, the biggest thing for them at this point. I mean, obviously backup right, but if you want to move on from. Uh, Lucas, it's important to emphasize that swing tackle, like that swing swing tackle, uh, type of player, type of player. Like before Charles, uh, I keep thinking of Charles. Before Lucas, you had uh, Inseki, and Inseki yeah. was a a swing tackle. And before him, you was trying trying to develop uh, Jerron Christian as that swing tackle for you, and that's how you ended up ultimately coming across. Uh, Lucas, but I think that's the that's the biggest deal. Like, does Lucas want to be a starter? Like, obviously so, but how does he fare in the in the market? Like, 
does mm-hmm. does other teams see him as that person who can be a sw- uh, a starting tackle for them, or do they see them view him as a backup? Uh, obviously, we're not going to know the answer until he can, you know, go out there and, and see for himself. But if he's a person who liked it in Washington and understands that, you know, it's not going to get no better than here, then maybe he goes back to a system that in a team that knows him best and and knows him knows him for for the type of player that he is and knows that he can be a a serviceable because I, I I didn't really I didn't really like how he played in, in most games, but mm. um, somebody who can, who can hold it down at least for a couple of games if, or a couple of plays if need be. So uh, I personally will move on from him and try to find better in free agency. I don't know what that swing tackle looks like in free agency. I, I, I don't know, but then I guess that's where we go to the draft and see who can be that serviceable swing tackle from a draft, from a prospect standpoint. But um, yeah, it all, it all depends on, you know, how they view Lucas, but I think swing tackle needs to be important because it also helps with how you can address the the 53 man roster on game day as well. Yeah, I think that's true. But, uh, you know, they also have to look at their ledger. I mean, you're, you're giving good money to your starting left tackle now. Uh, whereas I think you were kind of maximizing that whole tackle position for very little money last year. Now you're paying not outrageous numbers, but you're paying like the going rate at league wide, I feel like. So I don't know how much money they could put into a swing tackle at this point. I don't think you're going to pay anybody, you know, four or $5 million a year for that that anymore. You know, we'll see, but they don't, they, they, you know, they have to look at that aspect of this too, right? Like, are you better off just maybe finding a kid late in the draft and trying to develop them for next to nothing versus paying a free agent? Yeah. I mean, I think that's generally speaking normally better. Yeah. Yeah. Normal normally. Although, you know, some guys or coaches I think really do value that having that backup, that sixth lineman, whoever it is. You know, it definitely felt that way with uh Shanahan and Ty Seki and all that. Like they really loved him. I get the sense that it's or, like that strange that Washington hasn't really prioritized its offensive line at Iran Rivera a little bit. You know, they put no, very little resources into it. They really, I mean, they've spent all these draft picks on the defensive line and which sort of hasn't worked out. But I mean, other than Sam Cosme, mm. you know, a lot of teams are drafting left tackles in round one and, you know, all of that. And Washington hasn't done that. They're probably going to let Brandon Scherf go um, in the off season. Uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, these veterans for swing tackles. It's kind of strange, I think, the comparatively few few resources that they put into this position group. Well, they they had brought in, I, I guess it, I guess it's perspective, right? Like how, like to like to what what type of assets did or or capital did you want or expect them to do it? I, I guess that would be the question because if you think about it, 2020. They brought in Lucas. Um, mm-hmm. They brought in Sadiq, uh, and they already had Morgan for a year. Like they they had Morgan, so they didn't have to do much at the tackle, at the right tackle. They had Brandon, didn't have to do much there. Um, center, I think Schweitzer was here in 2019. I think that was his rookie season. Uh, and then you go across the board, left left guard was something and whatever. Uh, this this off season or 2021, you get Eric Flowers back. Um, you draft uh, the 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 right tackle from Texas, um, and then you find yourself uh, picking up Charles Leno as well. So I guess it all depends on how you view it. But over time, they they did invest into the offensive line, but like aggressively is one thing. Cause I don't remember how the I don't remember how the Leno thing went down, so y'all can help me with that. I don't remember how that went. Down. Well, they signed him to a one-year mediocre price right. deal, and then they've, you know, he played well, and so they signed him to a three-year extension. Okay, all right. So, so yeah, I think I think their their small investments uh, at certain positions ended up paying off. Like I don't I don't know how they expected the Leno thing to play out. I think they were just hoping for the best, and it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, Lucas, uh, he lost he lost his spot there. Sam Cosme, uh, and then obviously you're not looking too good with Sadiq, um, and now you're and you're looking good with Eric Flowers getting him back, but now you're you're trying to fill a void at right guard. So um, Schweitzer may be it, but you never really know. 
I mean, this team has a history of Hall of Fame play at left tackle, and they've spent many, you know, yeah. high level number one overall pick, you know, not overall, but number one first round picks uh, on left tackle and guard. And, you know, you know, Brandon Scherf was what top five pick. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it's just I, I'm not saying I even disagree with their approach necessarily. I just think it's kind of strange. That they haven't been more aggressive. That's what as saying. a Washington fan, you are used to people building around the O line, and it's there's a bit of a departure. Ron value shops, and he does a good job of it. That's I think what I see is he's not he doesn't want to spend big on these guys, but he finds guys he can get here, and he gets a lot out of them. He, they've got a very they've done a very good job, I think, for the most part, coaching up guys so far. That at least from what I can tell, uh, you know. We'll see how Cosme develops. That's, I think, going to be the big thing, honestly, because he looks like he could be their next, you know, young pro bowler on the line. I don't know if I go that far. I mean, I mean, could he be a good player? Sure. He's got the athletic talent. He's got very good athletic ability. A lot of people have athletic talent. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. So I don't know if there's anything really else to cover about the free no. agent. Uh, why don't we move on to the rookies coming out? Um, so you look at the rookies. I know they've done some of the combine re- uh, workout stuff. I'm, I'm looking over the not that impressive in terms of uh, the bench reps. It looks like it was mostly the guards well, who impressed there. Let's start th- on this. So yeah. no one from Tampa also did our draft preview tackle column, right. which is out there. And – just to throw some names out, it's for if you haven't paid a lot of attention to this, there's only four guys who are sort of known as first rounders. Evan Neal from Alabama, mm-hmm. who's like the Incredible Hulk, he's 360 right. pounds. I'm gonna bring. I've always mispronounced this guy's name, so forgive me ahead of time. Akeem Ikewanu, I believe, from mm-hmm. North Carolina State. Um, Charles Cross from Mississippi State. Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa. Those are the guys who, going into the combine, were known as the sort of the first rounders. Um, I would be just floored if Washington drafted any of them, you know, considering the conversation we just had. The second round talent types, uh, Darian Kennard from Kentucky, Bernard Raymond from Central Michigan, Nicholas Petit Friere, I believe, from Ohio right. State, and Daniel Falali. Those are the, if you want to know who the top guards are to pay attention to, pay attention to it's that. And of this group, Evan Neal, I think, is the clear-cut number one in this position oh, yeah. group. Definitely, he's the number one guy. Um, I know that Daniel Falali, American, I mean, yeah. uh, has wowed people at the combine just because he's a such a massive human being. I think yeah, he's he, even bigger. He's six eight, three hundred eighty yeah. pounds. It's crazy. Yeah. He, well, he weighed in at three eighty five. Uh, oh, did at he? The combine. Yeah. <laughs> Ate a few extra cheeseburgers. I see. <laughs> I guess so. Stopped <laughs> off at a steakhouse or two on the way from Minnesota <laughs> to Indiana. Um, uh, I, I only saw it because I think they said that was technically a weigh-in record for like the la- in, over the last ten years. Three eighty-five. Yeah. So <laughs> he's a big person, a very big guy. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you. like we just invested in a you know right tackle last draft, and you know what just... he is? He's an entire foot and two hundred pounds larger than me. Yeah. There you go. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, he's a giant. Steve, you would you would need a slingshot to fight him. <laughs> I could be his slingshot weapon. What are you kidding me? <laughs> he could slingshot me. No, no, vice versa. You're he's Goliath. You're David. I get that, but he could also use me for his slingshot. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay, I see what you're saying. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I just don't see them drafting any of these high round guys. I can see them, you know, lo- looking at some of these guys that Tampa had listed in the fourth and yeah, fifth round yeah so the ones that tampa had listed as the third through fifth round prospects uh sean ryan from ucla max mitchell from university of louisiana lafayette rashid walker penn state jamari mm-hmm. uh a sailor from georgia abraham lucas washington state kellen deesh from arizona state and braxton jones from southern utah those are the ones that no one right. had listed as the next group of prospects could they pick one of them up i mean it's possible if just, you're looking for a swing tackle, this is the easiest way to, you know, get one on the cheap. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that's kind of my thinking. Um, you know, but it 
with, with a lot of these guys, who knows? I, I feel like everyone who you draft as a tackle, if they don't work out, you just move them to guard, right? Kind of like what we're, they're doing right now with Sadiq Charles. Uh, I think they're know. trying to desperately figure out how to keep him on the roster is what they're well, doing. Yeah, but that's what you do. You, you, all right, we do, this didn't work. Move him in. <laughs> it, it worked out well with Brandon Scherf when they did it. It's worked it worked out around the NFL. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't forget, like, Eric Flowers was originally brought into the NFL as a tackle. He's a guard now. Yeah. The Raiders mm-hmm. had, who's that guy that the Raiders had for years who was a tackle? Um, the name's escaping me. But the point is, there's a history of that Yeah. in the NFL. Yeah, I, uh, well... No, Jac- Jacoby just moved from left tackle to right tackle. Eventually, yes, right. He, toward d- d- yeah, he, toward the end of his career. Yeah, he did. Yeah, did he? He never moved inside though. No, but it does happen all, all the time that when guys get old, they'll move inside or they'll switch sides, whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> I I don't know. I, I'm just looking. Not a lot of impressive combine numbers. I it, so few guys actually participate now. I just realized none of those top four guys even. I, I don't see numbers listed for any of them. I guess they just didn't work out at the combine. They just went for the interviews. I mean, to some, to some extent, some of these guys who are known as, you know, top end first round prospects, it's not really to their advantage to work out at the combine because they don't, right. they don't really have anything to prove. All they have to do is lose, uh, you know? And so I think if I was advising one of these guys, I might tell them the same thing, do the interviews, do the medical, mm-hmm. but the only thing that's going to you're not going to improve your draft stock by working out. So why do it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so in terms of looking at those numbers, Nick Zag, Zag, Z, Zag, you're speaking. It was yes. poorly as you write. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has a Zach LJ as his last name. Zach how wh- wh- how do you pronounce an L and J next to each other, Steve? I would have to see it. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, he's out of Fordham. He he had the best. Oh no, I'm sorry. He had the second best of all the tackles, uh, in terms of bench reps. Uh, kid out of Central Michigan beat him. But you know when you're talking about small school guys, I don't trust any small school tackle to play tackle in the NFL. I don't know why. Uh, I just assume I they get moved inside at some point. Small school tackles. I, I I feel like when it comes to like if you're gonna play left tackle in the NFL, yeah, I think you got. I, I would rather get with the guy who played in the SEC or ACC or Pac-12 or something. You know, I feel like guys from those smaller schools they could be good linemen, but they tend to end up on the right side. For in my mind, I don't know. I'm weird. It, that just might be me thinking wrong i don't know well we know you're weird <laughs> yeah no doubt about well, that we know that yeah. yeah yeah that's not news um and i will point out that a certain guy named joe jacoby came from the university of louisville so take that for what you will I, louisville was in the big east at that point weren't they is it a big is it a big sec school no not okay no but was the sec a big sec thing back then <laughs> i mean you know, college football was very different back then. Okay, who do you want me to try to pronounce? Uh, Nick. He's from Fordham. Nick Zagel. <laughs> I'm still looking here through the list. Dun, 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 dun. Somebody play the Jeopardy theme. For Z A K E L J. Try and pronounce. I that. would say Zach L G. Zach L G. <laughs> I feel like we're adding in like four vowels to make it work, but okay. No. That's why no Z A K E L J. Zakelji. That's what I would say. All right, I, I I would end the J with J, not G, but that's me. Um, yeah, I, I'm assuming that's got to be like a Nordic name. All right, a- anything you guys want, Jamal? I don't know if you have any thoughts on free or rookies drafting somebody. No, I have not. I have not looked at the rookie tackles, um, so I, I, I'm not going. I'm not going to say too much on them guys. All but, right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it right there. I just think it's not very likely that Washington's going to draft anybody above like the middle rounds at best. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we, it's one of these things we have to cover because we're covering the draft in general. But if you're a Washington fan and listening, um, this this is not your position group for top of the top of the draft prospects. No, no, this is a hey, they might have traded back some draft spots and found a guy that they lost. Yes, that's you know, right. That's that's usually when what we're talking about here. Uh, that's why we're covering it right now. Um, all right, well that covers the whole gambit on the tackles yeah so uh, before you move on alex so yep. what we're where we're facing here is we're going to do free, next week free agent running backs which is the last group we haven't covered for free mm-hmm. agency and then we'll be done with that free agency itself starts on the 16th of march um right and the the um legal tampering period starts on the 14th that's the period in which Teams can start contacting but can't sign, blah, blah, blah. So our show will be out right in time for that. Um, and so then draft-wise, what we've got coming up here is interior offensive line, which we were intending to cover this week but didn't. Um, and we've got tight ends, running backs, and then secondary. So if possible, we may play catch-up again next week to do tight ends and uh, offensive line, interior offensive line and tight ends both. Right. Okay. Tight ends still are, are kind of a little fun behind. to watch. So yeah. what's that? Tight ends. At least they're fun to watch. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's not. I, at least for me, I can't watch line play and figure. I'm not Robbie Duncan. I'm not going to be able to figure out what looks good and what looks bad. Generally speaking, Robbie you know. knows. Yeah, he does. Um, Robbie's the first one that said Ty Seki was going to be a good player. Yeah, yeah. He he told us he was a stud, and yeah. he was right. Mm-hmm. All right, last thing we had on the agenda for today. Uh, some news came out. I believe CBS, who also leaked those Virginia site stories, leaked some news about Maryland and the stadium discussion. Uh, Maryland has apparently put out a proposal. Uh, I don't know where it is in the exact process of, you know, is it going to the Maryland Senate or House or whatever, but... The proposal from Maryland side is that teams stay at Landover. They would help build a stadium closer to uh, Metro on some unused land that's out there. And they would build, you know, the whole commercial hullabaloo that Dan Snyder wants as well. Uh, So that's the latest on Maryland side. The catch that I saw reading about it and, things that people pointed out as like this would be a flag and why Dan wouldn't do it is if Maryland builds the stadium, Maryland owns the stadium. Um, being a real estate, commercial real estate expert. Right. Which I am. Um, for stadiums, it's pretty normal for it's, it's, it's normal for a governmental entity to own the stadium. Yeah. And it's very unusual for, an NFL team owner to own the stadium. The deal that Dan Snyder has is not normal. And it came about because mostly because Jack Kent cook didn't take a ton of money from other, from other sources. He put up a lot of it himself percentage wise. And it was fairly cheap at the time. For by the time, even at the time it was not a ton of money. Um, So I don't think it's that abnormal for the state of Maryland to say, if we're going to do this, we're going to own it. Now, the problem, of course, is that the state of Virginia has not made that demand. And they're kind of insinuating that Dan Snyder owns, would own the land and they're going to contribute, you know, bond, they're going to money in the form of bonds and stuff. So I think what I would learn, pick out of this is that Maryland would take, would take the team if Dan wants to come back or runs out of options, but they're not too keen on it. And if Virginia wants to go that route, have at it. I think that's sort of what I get out of it. Yeah. I, I kind of get that too. I'm <laughs> my first reaction when I, you know, saw that this was Maryland's proposal was basically, and I, I haven't looked at a map of where the stadium's at. I don't know where the land that they're talking about that's unused over there is. In your um, land over. Yeah, I mean, I know there's like wooded areas and things like that, but Not are they thinking hundreds like hundreds of acres of it though? No, no. But I'm wondering if they're thinking like if you go on the other side of 
four ninety five. I think that's where like the Largo Town Center yeah. stuff used to be, and right. well, it still is, but that's all kind of getting ripped up. Yeah. Um, well, is so, the old Cap Center are, still there? No, no, no. That's gone. You said what? 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 Was who still there? The old it, Cap Center that was across oh, the yeah, freeway from the stadium. The uh, the boulevard. That's what they. That's what they just got rid of. It's a um, they built up a health a health facility. I think it's. A hospital, actually. Okay, so they've already redeveloped the land. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I that was my first thought of maybe it's over there, but I I have no idea what empty land they're talking about. the The only thing I could think you could do is if you built in the parking lot next to the current stadium, like the Giants did, you know, a few decades back. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, is Landover Mall still a dump? Landover Mall does not exist anymore. Oh, it's um, gone totally, huh? I think I read it that too. Um, I think because I thought about this when I heard like next, right next to the stadium is, it's like how are you? I get it, but it's still residential area, so it's like how how are you? Are you displacing the individuals that live next to the stadium? Like how are you going to do that? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if literally mean next to it, and that'll be a, a whole that'll be a hell hole within itself trying to deal with the fans who are trying to go to the current stadium i just don't know how they're going to do that um unless they they because they really would have to kind of displace some people um which i mean well it's called gentrification it, and that's typically not what governments like to do you yeah know. so right. it'll be hard but like it's not a bad like it's not a bad sh- and with taking all of that out of the way it's not a bad area because it's still being developed like i I know like places around Landover that's um while it's not directly next to the stadium, like they're they'll build they'll they're building up the area, um, putting some money into the area, like Largo, mm-hmm. Largo for sure, which is still around the stadium. You have Largo Landover, Largo slash Mitchellville, Landover, um, and then uh 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 I forgot the other name that I'm, th- that I'm blanking on right now, but it's three different areas and directions that you can go just off of the exits of the stadium. And like, they're building up all around that area. So, um, you know, we'll see where they go. Like the nearest bar that you got is a Friday's and a Jasper's. Um, I thought the Friday's got shut down because I was there and they had like nothing the other day. So they did shut down a, they did shut down a Friday's, uh, but there are actually, you know what? You're right. They shut down the Fridays, but there's a Jasper's, a Longhorns, yeah. and the Applebee's in the same in the area as well. But it's not like in walking proximity of the stadium, and that's kind of yeah. like the big deal that people are making. And it's not within a mile of the stadium. It's it's a five minute drive without traffic, but you know it's it's not there. But I I just say that to say like it's in theory it's okay because in seven years it'll be much more developed and that's the plan is like the, the contract expires in 2027 so you want to have a new place to go so in theory like there'll still be it'll be a, a good and well-developed area but I, I just don't know how they're going to do it like unless they displace people um surrounding yeah. the stadium uh, i still the think only- the the best area if you're talking maryland is down at the oxen hill farm national right. harbor area if they could figure that out i, I mean, think i think we all agree that would be the best yeah but uh you know, I'm just looking at a map now of like the whole where by the stadium. The only thing I could think of is if somehow you took or able to get the par- giant parking lot by the metro, and there's a bunch of forested land between that and Central Avenue. I guess you could squeeze something in there. It'd be tight. It'd be very tight. And I don't know. And then you'd have to figure out a whole situation for parking. But. Uh, you know, like that would be the only option I could see there. And it, that ain't great. But listen, um, I mean, it's if it's the a, state of Virginia. Yeah. Will let Dan Snyder own the land. Right. This isn't even a discussion. Well, so from what I remember, Virginia's offer was. I don't remember if it was he owned the land or not. Was it? I thought uh, yes. Because I thought he, there was like a co. There was like a board where Virginia got five seats, Dan got four seats, or something. I think like you're that. talking about bonds. Yeah. State issued bonds. That's you know I'm not going to get into what bonds are because it's not the economics hour, but that's something totally and completely different. Okay, so that just had to do with the bonds. That right? has that to, do to do with public financing. Is what yeah, that okay. is. Okay. 
That's I how that the had government's who raised the money. They'll issue bonds and people invest in bonds. And then you take the, the money they invest and hand it over to construction, you know, use it for construction money. And then over time, the government will pay the bond investors back. That's what sure. the bonds are. Sure. Okay. I, I mean, I know what a bond is, generally speaking. I, I just, I didn't know if that had anything to do with the no. bonds. I thought it had to do with property ownership. No. Okay. Yeah. It. Look, it, I think it was just a half-hearted effort by Maryland there to say, you know. I mean, it's not really, I wouldn't say it's half-hearted. I would say it's a deal that was presented on Maryland's terms. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you want it, yeah. you want it. If you don't, you don't. That's what I, it is. I mean, here's the thing. If you're talking about Dumfries, Landover starts looking a hell of a lot more attractive as a location wise. I don't think anybody's taking Dumfries seriously, though. I mean, mm -hmm. surely not. Supposedly, that's Dan's number one, is what they're saying. I, I said this last week, Jamal. I don't know how you feel, but um, yes, I don't think Dumfries is almost down by Quantico. It's not even really in the DC area, all of that. But, however, comma, um, if the team just starts to win, people will go. And I don't think the team cares where they come from as long as somebody – as long as they sell out. And so uh, the, I think the location is almost less important to a certain extent. is less important than actually winning. And so I, while I wouldn't want – the, if I was building a stadium in D.C., I personally wouldn't want to do it out that far. I think it's actually less of a concern than people really think it is. I agree. Um, I agree mainly. A uh, quick, a quick point. Circle back to the seven years from now, um, and apply that conversation in Landover and Largo, and apply it to Dumfries too. Like, apparently, it's not fully developed now, but in seven years, like you have the space to to develop around a potential stadium. So mm -hmm. apply that part there. Um, but then also to what you're saying. Like location doesn't matter because people can make a trip out of it. People can make a trip out of staying out there for for a couple of days or having a hotel for a night or an Airbnb in a certain location or something like that. Like none of that actually matters. And um, I mean, while yes, people will get further detached from the team, especially the PG County people, uh, Washington D.C. And I say less of Washington D.C. because um, people don't even realize like. Steve actually mentioned gentrification on the show. Like part of that gentrification, people from the city, true, true these Washingtonians, they got displaced. And where did they go? They ended up going to Waldorf, Maryland. A lot of people went out to Waldorf. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people went further south of PG County. So, um, like that's that's where the true Washingtonians are now. Like they're in that PG County area, which is the like the the border of Washington D.C. really, um. Yeah. So the further you move to Virginia, yes, you'll lose us. You may lose a certain section of the fan base, but I think that that decision to go to Dumfries, if they decide to do that, they are fully aware of what's become of the fan base. Like they already know that, so it's not gonna hurt them. Just if they keep winning, uh, you have two options. You you have fans that's gonna be, um, you know, saying F it, I'm gonna go. Or then you'll have fans who will still refuse to go and you'll end up looking like the Los Angeles Chargers in their stadium, in their home stadium, or even the Los Angeles Rams in their home stadium when other teams come into town and it's just it's still flooded. Like it is what it is. Yeah. Or I, Washington. I mean, <laughs> yeah. There, exactly. Like there's a very bold assumption like in this whole discussion of winning. Uh because if Dan Snyder's still around, they ain't gonna be doing it. Uh, you know, the dude just is bad mojo. Uh, to put it diplomatically, I mean, he's, it's not that he has bad mojo. It's that he's a terrible human being. He's a terrible owner who doesn't care about winning, cares about himself. Right. And he's run the team into the ground, and he's fa utterly failed to establish a winning culture. Yes. It's like not I about said, mojo. I was it's trying about to put it he's a horrible owner. He's a horrible leader. Yes. That's what it is. He's and I used to live in Upper Marlboro in the '90s, and back then it kind of felt like on the outskirts, sort of a country town kind of. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's I don't not, know if it, no. Now it's just straight up DC suburb. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Back then it wasn't, which is yeah. why I was there. Yeah, it, it, Upper Marlboro, all, all those like Largo, it all, you know, so, as someone who lives on the DC border side of that, 
Like it, it, it doesn't really, it's not like the suburbs let up at any point <laughs> going from here to upper Marlboro. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's changed. Imagine yeah. that in 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the only difference is, you know, there might be golf courses once you get out there still. <laughs> That's about it. Um, so uh, here's the thing. I, to me, the ranking of possibilities remains the same. Virginia, number one, Maryland, number two, DC, a very distant number three. Yeah, I don't think he, anything has changed as a result of Maryland's proposal this week. No, no, I don't think so either. And I, I would even go one step further. I think Dumfries is the number one. I, that's where I really think they want to put it for some reason. Uh, I think Sterling will be second, then maybe Landover, and then the one, the third spot in Virginia. Well, I mean, you got Jamal has a good point, though. I mean, uh, and it's what we were just talking about. I mean, development happens. And so what seems today to be an insanely far out stadium may not be seen quite so far out in 15 years. Maybe, but it's not like they're going to put a, a bridge over into Maryland or a high or a second beltway or like it. We're talking about a well, one road in one road out yeah. area. And everyone's going the same direction for the most part, because yeah. Virginia can say what they want. Not enough people come up from Richmond and South to really make it noticeable in terms of that traffic. Well, uh, I mean, again, I mean, people are going to show up for games if the team wins. Yeah, they could put it anywhere. I always said my my joke was always they could play in the parking lot of Piggly Wiggly and they would win, you know, and as long as they won, people would show up. And that's just what the NFL is. Sure. That goes for every team. <clears throat> well, uh, are, are people showing up to the Chargers yet? I, I don't know even. I think it's a lot better than it was. Okay. Yeah, it's probably a lot better now that they got their new stadium. That, yeah. And, and they have a quarterback. For a second. Yeah, quarterback. I, I just, I, I still think back to when they were playing at the soccer stadium and couldn't even fill 24,000. Don't forget who has the worst attendance in the NFL. I know. Washington. Yeah. Well, or Detroit. Detroit. I think Washington, Washington was and Detroit 32 split overall. back and forth based off of percentage and. It depends on what what metric you're looking at. Yeah. But those yeah. are the two worst. Yeah. So just build a thirty thousand seat stadium and embrace it. <laughs> Say you sell out every week. Yeah. Uh-huh. Bring you'd back need, the sellout you know, streak. You'd still need t- twenty thousand, you know, visiting team fans to do it, but you know. <laughs> A thirty thousand seat stadium all the way down in Quantico, done. <laughs> It'd be invaded by Steelers fans, right? Right. And now it's because the team stupidly changed their uniforms. You wouldn't be able to tell the Steelers apart from Washington. Or oh, the, when we you know. when we wear the black uniforms, yeah. Well, there's no we. Well, okay. When Washington wears the black uniform, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know what? We're right. Almost at an hour. Let's call it a day. Jamal's got to go. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Uh, tune in next week. We're going to talk more about the combine because we'll have all the numbers finally, you know, set up. And I'm sure, you know, everyone's going to have their players they've fallen in love with, with like Malik Willis, who I think is going to be that guy for a lot of fans. Um, Newsflash. But- he shouldn't be a number one pick. Number yeah. one, a first round pick. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you. All right, we will talk about though that next week. Later. Bye. Peace.